as the Reformation gained momentum, there was in one of the schools of Paris a thoughtful, quiet youth already giving evidence of a powerful and penetrating mind. His genius and application soon made him the pride of the college, and it was confidently anticipated that he would become one of the ablest and most honored defenders of the church. But a ray of divine light penetrated even the walls of that school and the superstition by which he was enclosed. Chancing one day to visit one of the public squares, he witnessed there the burning of a heretic. He was filled with wonder at the expression of peace which rested upon the martyr's countenance. Amid the tortures of that dreadful death and under the more terrible condemnation of the church, he manifested a faith and courage which the young student painfully contrasted with his own despair and darkness while living in the strictest obedience to the church. Upon the Bible, he knew the heretics rested their faith, and he determined to study it and to discover, if he could, the secret of their joy. And as he turned to the Bible, he found Jesus Christ. Those words from the book Great Controversy tell the story of one of the most well known reformers, at least in his early beginnings, John Calvin. And as John Calvin found Jesus in the Bible, he spoke these words. O Father, he cried, his sacrifice, Jesus's, has appeased thy wrath. His blood has washed away my impurities. His cross has borne my curse. His death has atoned for me. We had devised for ourselves many useless follies, but thou hast placed thy word before me like a torch, and thou hast touched my heart in order that I may hold in abomination all other merits save those of Jesus Christ. The merits of Jesus Christ. At that young age, John Calvin found the merits of Jesus Christ to be his only hope. And on that foundation, he became a champion for our topic today, grace and grace alone. For Calvin, it all began with an understanding of his own condition, that no matter how hard he tried, no matter how faithful he tried to be to the church, he was left with nothing but an emptiness and anxiety and fear filled his heart. He came to understand that all mankind shared that experience. That in our own efforts to be faithful, to follow the teachings of the church, there is nothing that will bring peace to our hearts in that kind of a man-made faith. For Calvin and even Calvinism today, that became one of the major pillars of their faith of grace, the depravity of mankind. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today, because sometimes I feel we probably spend too much time on that. And yet we dare not define grace and look at grace today without understanding first how important grace is to each one of us. And so in our Bibles today, I want us to turn to the book of Job, Job chapter 14, and we want to look at the first four verses. Job chapter 14 and verses 1 to 4. 
If you're following along in the Pew Bible, that is page 507, Job chapter 14, and verses 1 to 4. The Bible verses, by the way, that we will be using today are some of the very ones that John Calvin would have used in Scripture to find the things that he found in his understanding of grace. Bible verses today that Calvinism still holds dear to their hearts as a truth, as ones who follow the truth that John Calvin brought to them. And we should probably say that God brought to them through John Calvin. Job 14, 1-4, Man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. Do you fix your eye on such a one? Will you bring him before you for judgment? Who can bring what is pure from the impure? And the answer to that question is what? No one. Job is really questioning God, and his question is, how can there be something clean produced from something that is unclean in its beginnings? And he is describing the condition of mankind, and man is in quite a dilemma if we understand what these verses are telling us. What these verses tell us is that there is no way or no one who can produce something clean from something that begins as what? Unclean. Something holy from something that begins as being unholy. And because of that, Job tells us man is nothing more than like a flower. It looks very good and promising as it comes up through the ground. But at the end of the day, it is only going to do what? Fade away, wither, and die. Paul in the book of Romans chapter 3 paints a very similar picture. He tells us there that there is no one who is righteous. No, not even what? Not even one. But it gets worse than that if we follow what he says because there is no one who will even seek after who? After God and that which is righteous. And because of that, he says, humanity is faced with no other option but the wages of sin, which is death. Job came to the conclusion that because of what we are, we are subject to death. Paul comes to the conclusion that there is no one righteous and therefore we are all subject to death. Our scripture reading as it was read to us this morning began with the fact that all of humanity, at least up to a certain point, and that's the good news that we will get to, but up to a certain point we are all dead in our trespasses and our sin. And as Calvin went through Scripture, he came to the conclusion that there was absolutely in humanity itself no hope. That humanity in and of itself was subject to only one thing, and that was death. And that was the depravity of man. But there would be good news, because that's what the Bible is, right? The Bible is full of good news. It tells us the reality of who we are and our condition, but it paints a beautiful picture of a way out. And one of the most powerful verses that was found in Scripture for them was in the book of John, chapter 5, and we want to turn there together today. John, chapter 5, and we want to look at verses 24 and 25. John chapter 5 and verses 24 and 25. Page 1055 in your pew Bible. Again, that's John 5, and we'll start here with verse 24. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. 
and will not be condemned. And then look at what Jesus says. He has crossed over from death to what? To life. There's the answer to humanity's problem. In and of ourselves, we are subject to one thing and one thing only, and that is what? That is death. But in Christ Jesus, it says, we can pass over from what? Death into life. Is that not good news? Are you thankful for Jesus today and the fact that he can bring us from death into life? I am thankful for that. Matthew Henry in his commentary says, The grace of the gospel is a full discharge from the curse of the law. He has passed out of death to life. He is invested in a present happiness in spiritual life and entitled to a future happiness in eternal life. A present happiness in the spiritual life and entitled to a future of happiness in eternal life. The promise of Jesus. But we want to go back and look at verse 25 now because obviously Jesus here in verse 24 is talking about a spiritual transformation that can only come through him and that is passing from death to life. But notice what Jesus does here in verse 25. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will what? Live. Jesus switches gears here. What is that time out in the future when there will be those who are dead who hear the voice of Jesus and live again? What is he talking about there? It's the second coming of Jesus. Are you looking forward to that today? Is that good news? You know, as I was reading that this week, I'm going through some baptismal studies with a couple groups of young kids in our church, and recently we went through the one on death and the resurrection. And I have all of the Bible verses on my computer, so we can just go through them. But at the beginning of each new lesson, I have a picture, and on the death and resurrection, there is a very beautiful picture. It shows Jesus coming in the clouds of the heavens, and there down below there are graves that are opened up and mothers and fathers who are being reunited with their children, families that are being brought together again. And it's kind of interesting to see the kids' response to that picture. There is something in that picture that is appealing to them even as young kids. And there's something that should be appealing to each of our hearts to think about that day when Jesus comes and the dead in Christ come forth from the grave. I have told you this before and I shared this with these young kids in our studies. On that day, I am going to meet a sister that I have never seen before. I look forward to Jesus coming. This promise is true, isn't it? That one day Jesus is coming. There are others of you here in this room today who have lost children. And on that day, you are going to see your child again. There are people here who have lost spouses and you are going to see that one you love again when Jesus comes. But Jesus does something really neat here. He says, not only that day in the future, but it is a day that has already what, he says. It has already come. Well, what is Jesus talking about? The fact is, Jesus could be referring back to the spiritual resurrection that he mentioned in verse 24, but in the context of verse 25, it is highly likely that what he is really saying to those that were there that day is, in this very day you are living you are going to see an example of what is going to happen in the future at the resurrection when Jesus comes. Well, what does this have to do with grace and what they discovered about grace? Well, let's go and turn now to John chapter 11 because this becomes very important to their study in grace. 
Because you see here in John chapter 5, Jesus is connecting this spiritual resurrection, passing from death unto life, with the physical resurrection. And he says, you are going to be able to experience it even now when I am here. And so in John chapter 11, we look at the story of Lazarus. We're going to start in verse 38 and read down through verse 44. But as we're turning there and getting ready to read, we know the story here. And and this story is fascinating for a, a whole lot of reasons. One of the neatest things to me about this story is just the conversation that goes back and forth between Jesus and his disciples. They just never seem to quite get it sometimes when Jesus is explaining things. We know that Jesus and his disciples weren't back with Lazarus when he was sick and nearing death because it wasn't the safest place for them to be. And then when Jesus gets that message that Lazarus is dead, he tells his disciples, well, we're going to go back and we're going to do what? We're going to wake Lazarus up because he is asleep. Now, the disciples know that's not the safest place to be, so they're not really anxious to go back there anyway. But this really sounds kind of crazy to go back when it's not safe. But then secondly, if somebody's sick and they're asleep, it's probably not a good thing to go and wake them up. And Jesus says, no, you guys don't get it. What I'm telling you is Lazarus is what? Dead. And so we pick up in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved. And I like that picture of Jesus as he's before the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Verse 39, take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He has been there for four days. That becomes very important to what we're going to look at. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have what? God already had heard the prayer of who? Jesus. Isn't that neat? God always hears, doesn't he? I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, go, take off the grave clothes and do what? Let him go. Four days, Lazarus had been dead. Important in the story? Very much so, because in the Jewish culture, that meant he was really dead. There was no chance that he was just under the weather, no chance that he was just sick, no chance that there was you know, time for him to somehow be alive again. He was dead, and there was nothing he could do do about it. And this is where we come back to what we read in John. It is in Christ, in Christ alone, that we can pass from death to life. Lazarus in that tomb in no way, shape, or form could do anything to bring life again to his body. He could even do nothing to seek after that. He couldn't even ask Jesus to bring him back to life? Was there anything he could possibly do to have life? Nothing. And when Calvin and many of the early reformers began to put this picture together, they came to the conclusion that that is how it is for our salvation. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And there is nothing even in any of us because of that that can even seek after that which God desires to give us. We are dead. We reek of sin and death. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, we can do about it. Save what? The grace of God. So much were they impressed with what they were putting together here 
that Calvin and the majority of the other early reformers went as far as saying that even asking God, even believing in God and trusting him enough to ask for the gift of grace and salvation was works and therefore something that you couldn't do in your own salvation. And therefore, they came up with a term that is called election. Other places in the Bible would call it predestination. What they came to the understanding of was this, that they were only able to have salvation because of God. And God had already determined those who were going to be saved as well as those who weren't going to be saved. In other words, God could have said from the beginning of time, as example, this half of the church is going to be saved, and this half of the church, sorry about this, you just sat on the wrong side today, um, you're not going to be. And really, apologies to the Walla Walla kids that are here, why did we sit on this side? And their belief was there was nothing that you could do to change that. So what did they do with John 5 verse 24 that tells us that it was those who believe in Jesus Christ who could pass from death unto life? Because if we can't even use the choice to believe in Jesus without it being works and therefore not true grace and that God has already determined that, what do we make of Jesus putting those things in the Bible? What do we make of John 3.16? For God so loved the world that whosoever believes, not just this side of the church, but whosoever believes can have eternal life. What do we do with God's desire that all men would be saved and that none should perish? Not just that this side would be saved and this side was doomed to perish, but that all could have eternal life. Well, there was another pillar of their belief in grace that is called irresistible grace. And I will let them define it because that's not where I come from. And... Irresistible grace is this. The idea that the elect, those who Calvinists believe, have been unconditionally elected to eternal life, cannot resist the grace of God and heaven's determination to save them. As those elected to damnation can do nothing about it, those who are elected to salvation can do nothing to resist it. The grace of God overwhelms them in such a way that even if they wanted to, they could not repeal it. In other words, they could not reject it. Now there's a problem that starts to come up here, isn't there? Because this was, in their minds, grace. But it seems to be missing something, doesn't it? It seems to be missing some grace because you guys over here need a little bit right now right they got maybe too much and you didn't get any interesting isn't it along comes a man by the name of Jacobus Arminius And he looked at this election where God had determined one way or the other and there really wasn't any choice. And he says that doesn't fit scripturally. Doesn't fit with John chapter 4 and verse 25 because it talks about those who believe in Jesus Christ as the ones who are going to pass from death to life. And then he goes to another verse, and I would have you turn with me there. We read the first part for our scripture reading today. We want to go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 6 through 9 here. Ephesians chapter 2. I already read the first five verses of that chapter. 
page 1157, and we're going to go verses 6 to 9. We want to listen very carefully to what God is saying through the Apostle Paul to us here, Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 6 to 9. Verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches, the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then verse 8 is the one that we know so well, isn't it? For it is by what? Grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, not of who? Not of ourselves. And not of works, lest we do what? We boast. So we are saved by grace through faith, but not of ourselves. That not of ourselves is what we want to stop and look at for a second. What is that referring to? Is it referring to our salvation? Our grace or faith? Well, the way that it is written in the Greek tells us that it has to be our salvation. Our salvation is not of ourselves, but our salvation is made up of God's grace and what? Faith. It says we are saved by grace through faith. And so what? Paul is telling us here in Ephesians, just in a brief summary, is that every one of these are a gift from who? From God. Our salvation is a gift. The grace of God is a gift. And even our faith is a what? It is a gift from God. It is not of ourselves. It can't be because salvation as a whole is not of ourselves. Therefore, no part of our salvation can be from ourselves. Romans 10 tells us that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes from who? From the word of Christ Jesus. Our faith comes from where? The word of God. The Word of God as we read it here, perhaps. The Word of God as the Holy Spirit impresses it upon our hearts. But that is where our faith comes from. It is a gift. It isn't something we manufacture. A matter of fact, I think if we look at it, there's a better word than gift for our faith. It's that God prepares faith in us. Listen to how Adam Clark here in his commentary expresses this. Is faith the gift of God? Yes, as to the grace by which it is produced. But the grace or power to believe and the act of believing are two different things. In other words, God places faith and the power of believing in us, but that is different than us acting upon it. There is still a decision and a choice that we have to make. The actual faith, the ability to believe, and the power to believe and make that choice are given of God, and yet there's still something that we need to do, isn't there? That's why Arminius called it, as that flies away on me, Arminius calls it conditional grace. Because there is a condition that there is something we must do with what God has given us. goes on to say, without the grace or power to believe, no man ever did or can believe. But with the power, the act of faith is man's own. God never believes for any man, no more than he repents for him. The penitent, through his grace enabling him, believes for himself. God produces within us the ability to believe. Stop and think about the Word of God. Why do you have it today? Why is it even here today? Is there a divine presence through the thousands of years that has preserved this for us today? If you know the stories, there is more than a divine miracle that took place that this is even here. We did nothing 
to have this today. It is a gift from who? From God. How about the desire to open this book and read it? Is that something you have in and of yourself? It's not there. The Holy Spirit places a desire in your heart to open this. How about what you read? Can you understand it in and of yourselves? No, the Bible makes it clear we only truly understand through the power of what? The Holy Spirit. It is a gift we have received, but it is the Holy Spirit that draws us to it, the Holy Spirit that helps us understand it, the Holy Spirit that brings us to the place of a decision, the Holy Spirit that even gives us the power to make the decision, but at the end of the day, it is still who that makes the decision. It is me or it is you. And as I think about this and as I study it out, I come to the conclusion that Calvin really wasn't that far off with his belief in irresistible grace. It isn't that heaven forces it upon us, but is not God's grace irresistible in a certain way? Follow with me here for a minute as I illustrate this. You come home with me and you get out of my car with me, and the moment you get out, you can already smell an aroma coming from the house. You come to the door and you open the door, and everything that you thought was about to happen now comes true. That aroma is unmistakable. There is fresh bread that has just come out of the oven. Perhaps I had planned on going downstairs to my office, but there is something that is drawing me in a different direction now. Not down to my office, but up to the kitchen. And as I turn the corner and look on the counter there on the cooling racks, my eyes tell me that my nose hasn't deceived me. There are fresh loaves of bread right out of the oven. The smell, the sight of them, draws me right to them. And there on the counter is a bread knife. And off of the end of one of those loaves comes that heel. The crust is just right because it is fresh out of the oven. Out comes the butter and the butter knife, and you dig into that butter, and as you lay it across the bread, it just kind of melts in. And then next comes the honey. And you just drizzle it heavily over that warm, melted butter. And then you do what you've been drawn to do. You eat it. It is irresistible. So much so that you go to the other end of the loaf <laughs> and you repeat all of the steps that you just did. There is something about that loaf of bread because I know where it came from. And I know the reason that my wife made it is because in her heart there is a love for her family, for her husband, a desire to do something good. And as she does that, there is something about it that draws me to that place. And my wife does come in the kitchen and she will say something like, did you have to take both ends off of the loaf? But that's not really what she's saying, is it? What's she really feeling inside? There is something good there because her act of love has been what? 
It's been accepted. And there is something in her heart, no matter what she tells me, whether it's one loaf or four loaves that get their ends lopped off. <laughs> no matter what she says, I know there is a joy in her heart because what she has done, I have made mine. God's grace, I believe, is irresistible in the same way. It draws us to him from afar. And the closer we get, the more irresistible it gets. Now, I can guarantee you, my wife doesn't come to me with the bread knife and say, you must eat this. There is no choice. You have been elected to eat the ends off of every one of these loaves. I predetermined it. Even if you don't want to, you don't have a choice. There's nothing like that at all, and yet is there anything that hinders me from doing it? No, a matter of fact, everything is telling me to come and take it. God's grace is the same way as he puts it before you today. It is beautiful in every single way. It is a gift of love like you cannot imagine. As you get closer and closer, the aroma turns into something you see and and what you see comes into something that you sense with all of your senses and you realize that this is so good that I can't help but make it mine. God's grace. For Arminius, it came down to this. Before the foundation of this world, God determined who was going to be saved. And his determination was this, that whosoever believeth in the name of Christ Jesus because there is no other name under heaven by which you may be saved. If you believe in Jesus, you are taken from death to life. Pretty neat promise, isn't it? Before you and I even existed, before we made the mess of this life, that we have made it. God made a promise. I'm going to save everyone who believes in my son, Jesus Christ. And I love Romans, how Paul puts it there. Every promise, every promise of God is a yes in Christ Jesus. It is by grace and grace alone that we have been saved. God's amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. God's amazing grace. Are you thankful today? Are you thankful for the Calvins of our world who are willing to leave behind what they were to discover who they could be in Christ Jesus? We may not fully agree to where he came to when it was all said and done, but is that an issue here today? I praise God for the Calvins of the world who got the ball rolling in the right direction. The Arminiuses of the world that kept it going. The Wesleys who took it from there and kept it going. And ultimately, we are here today by God's grace. We are here today by God's grace through those men who were willing to put their lives on the line to remind God's people who he really was and what his grace was about. 
And so today, we celebrate God's amazing grace. We celebrate that we are saved by grace and grace alone.